All right. Next panel, as promised. Joining the panel are three gentlemen who probably need no introduction. I'm talking about Sergei Nazarov of Chainlink. I'm talking about David Rudder from R3. And, of course, Joseph Lubin of Consensus. Um, in this panel, let's hear from them discuss real commercial applications of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, where is it proving its value? Where is it essentially, you know, making waves, making changes, making progress? And most importantly, you know, why does it matter to the future of fintech? Uh, joining them in this discussion is Anna Herrera from Reuters. Um, she's been covering fintech and blockchain for for. for quite a while already. So I'm actually very interested to see what kind of questions she'll be asking these three gentlemen that have been in not just the enterprise blockchain, but CBDC space as well. On top of that, by the way, um, after this, I'll be handing things over back to my co-host Glenn for the rest um, of the morning or evening, depending on where you are. And I'll be back with you again tomorrow at 9 p.m. for a fireside chat with Vitalik Buterin. With that being said, Anna, Gentlemen, please take it away. Once again, my name is Gabriel. Thank you, everybody, and I'll see you guys soon. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, so we, I have some great panelists here today with us to discuss um, a topic that many of you have, may have been hearing for a while now. So obviously, blockchain has been a very big topic in fintech for a couple of years, and um, so I want to start off by asking the panelists um, to give us a sense of what's happened this year, where we're at with, um, with blockchain. Um, what, what's been the highlights of the year? Do you want to start, Sergey? Sure, sure. The, the highlight for me has been the, the rise of decentralized finance. So decentralized finance is an evolution in what smart contracts are used for. Uh, smart contracts initially were used for tokenization and generating tokens that are then moved around uh, various private keys and basically between users. And that's what has come to define the blockchain industry so far as kind of a tokenization software product. But for me, tokenization is really kind of the email of, of blockchains. It's the initial and even probably unencrypted email first use case of this technology. And now with decentralized finance, uh, based on the value that's been seeded in the ecosystem with the help of tokens and tokenization, you now have the ability to make financial products. And those financial products secure anywhere from 10 to 15 billion, depending on the day. And they've, that's growth from you know, one oh. to two billion towards, towards the start of this year. And so that, that growth has been rapid. And actually there's another couple of hundred billion left to go uh, in, in the amount of value that could be in the DeFi format. But I, I would say the rise of decentralized finance during this year is probably um, the, no, the most notable thing that, uh, that I've seen in, and been, been lucky to be part of. Joe, I think this is a good segue for you. What was your highlight? Sure. Absolutely. So I have to agree with Sergey, and uh, I'll, I'll try to take a different approach to describing um, what I think is incredible about uh, open decentralized finance. Um, just like the internet and the web technologies uh, enabled the democ democratization of access to information globally, uh, the ability to create content uh, and publish content, uh, the ability to communicate in real time, audio, video, text, etc. cetera, um, e-commerce, e uh, social networking, um, uh, blockchain technology, um, and uh, the advent of this uh, this open decentralized finance phenomenon um, is bringing democratization to, to the world of finance. Uh, so first, um, what is enabling all of that is uh, the fact that we are building a base trust layer. Uh, so decentralized protocol technology, uh, and in particular, um, massively decentralized networks like Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, enable a new approach to trust, a new foundation for trust on the planet. So uh, they're moving uh, our ability to imbue systems with trust from uh, essentially subjective mechanisms to automated and objective uh, trust mechanisms. And uh, um, it's exactly that uh, new trust architecture uh, that enables um, the development of a new um, financial infrastructure. Uh, so DeFi protocols, uh, which are 
uh, largely being executed on Ethereum. I think 96% of DeFi transactions uh, have been on Ethereum since uh, uh, since the start. Um, they involve lending, borrowing, uh, stable coins, uh, derivatives, synthetics, equities, bonds, uh, full life cycle, digital asset management, insurance, prediction markets. Um, and they are all executed uh, by innovators. Um, so you don't need to be a priest uh, of a financial temple in, in order to uh, build new financial protocols. And uh, you don't need special access to link financial protocols together. Um, uh, they've been called uh, financial Legos um, and internet money Legos. And uh, uh, the fact that they're executed in software um, enables uh, smart, creative people to wire them together um, for their own purposes or, or to offer them to, uh, to a wide variety of people. David, what, what was your highlight? Well, I'm going to take, yeah, take a, a totally different tack. This has obviously been such a horrible year for all of us. You know, it's even tough to see the, the silver linings. But I think that we're seeing digital transformation accelerate uh, and I did a little research at the beginning uh, of the pandemic and that's always been the case with major setbacks um, and not just related to pandemics but also to economic crises and the like and so we're all seeing that in in our real life for us at R3 because we focus on enterprise blockchain for large uh, corporates and, and central banks and the like um, for us it was about getting real this year because some and now some have ramped up completely. Um, and as you know, many of the other uh, blockchains will discover when they get into production, especially for high throughput and high value uh, asset classes, you learn a lot about, uh, you know, about your firm, about your software and, and how, to, uh, how to assist your customers achieve success. So as difficult as it's been with all of us working remotely, it's been a transformational year and we're seeing things accelerate, so I'm really excited about that. So over the past few years, um, I've certainly heard of a lot of um, proof of concepts, tests, blockchain for this, blockchain for that. They're like, it's even hard to follow them, track them, or count them. So can you help sort of viewers understand or, or just get a sense of what has moved beyond the testing phase, particularly when it comes to sort of businesses using blockchain or just, just concrete examples of um, things that are in production and, and achieving results. Sure. I mean, if I can continue with that, uh, Anna, for, you know, we have, a, we have a short period of time. I could jump into a lot of different examples. But for us, the one we like to point to is the Spunta project, which we did with NTT Data and the ABI in Italy, where... Um, over 90% of the nation's banks are now using Corda to reconcile daily transactions. There's been over 200 million transactions on that platform since it launched uh, with a 98% um, match rate instantly, which compares to some of these matches taking days, weeks, or, or years. So you're talking about billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars. So that is a very real example, and you can, you can research it. There's a lot of public material out there. Another one for us, which I've mentioned before, is the digital ventures. And this is, I want to mention this because it's in Asia. Um, the Siam Cement Company, working with digital ventures as a software provider, now has 6,400 suppliers on the quarter network on a, on a uh, solution called procure to pay and the statistics they're reporting is that the time of settlement has been reduced by 50 percent uh the cost by over 70 percent so they're just two you know real examples and then of course there's you know this uh sdx and what they're doing nasdaq's involvement so we're seeing the exchanges ramp up as well but again you know i'm i come from the uh the enterprise uh, blockchain space for for big corporates and, and the like, which is a slightly different angle uh, than, than the other gentlemen. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, so consensus spends uh, maybe 60, 65% of its attention on building 
infrastructure tools and applications for public mainnet Ethereum. And we take that technology and uh, uh, we have enterprise enabled it um, and uh, it's been used in the form of quorum and uh, and other components that we've built uh, for a wide variety of enterprise use cases. Um, they range from commodity trade finance to um, commodity trade post-processing uh, in, in consortium networks like Congo and Covantis um, to provenance of luxury goods and foodstuffs uh, to um, digital asset issuance um, where uh, we've taken portfolios of real estate. Uh, uh, Mata Capital is an example in France uh, and tokenized uh, real estate portfolios, issued tokens and uh, enabled trading. Um, we uh, um, are seeing a brand new technology uh, that we pioneered with Ernst & Young called Baseline Protocol, uh, which has tremendous implications for enterprise um, and um, essentially sits significantly on public mainnet Ethereum. So Baseline Protocol enables organizations to sync up their data, to sync up agreements, to sync up business processes. Um, uh, by uh, running software on their side of the firewall, um, accessing their own systems of record, databases, or, or even blockchains on, on their side of the firewall, uh, and creating zero-knowledge proofs uh, that are then uh, lodged in a smart contract on mainnet Ethereum, and they keep uh, a number of counterparties in sync uh, with respect to uh, transactions, business processes, etc. Et uh, so. Um, this is a, a project that's new, but uh, um, organizations like the Coca-Cola Bottlers of North America have, are, are creating um, transparency in their supply chain uh, without leaking any, um, any competitive information um, onto uh, mainnet. Sergey, do you want to add something? So I guess I'll move sort of to Sorry. the, oh um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing two kind of fascinating use cases that have emerged over the, the course of this past year, and I'm actually seeing them interact in, in meaningful ways with each other. So the first one is these decentralized financial products, which, which Joe rightly pointed out, are basically these permissionless innovation type of environments where people can make a protocol and then they can provide it to others for consumption as a service, or they can provide that protocol to other protocols, which is very similar to the way that the web was built, right? Where you basically had libraries being generated by various different web teams, and then all those different libraries and APIs started to get composed. So I think the first thing that you see is, you know, the 15 billion in DeFi is is a huge over 10x increase over over the course of over the course of this year. And very importantly, it's be, being built in a way that is reusable by future versions of that ecosystem and other DeFi protocols. The, the second category is actually decentralized insurance. So already now, with the help of smart contracts and oracles, we can make decentralized crop insurance. And decentralized crop insurance is a, is a whole new way to use smart contracts on production, basically providing insurance to places and people that wouldn't have traditionally had it because their local legal system wouldn't have enabled that. And it also gives the insurance companies a huge amount of opportunity because it opens up entirely new markets regardless of the local legal dynamics. And so what I'm, what I'm actually seeing is I'm seeing more and more um, new types of smart contracts like decentralized insurance or supply chain related contracts for refactoring or any number of other contracts slowly flowing into more public systems and then being combined with the DeFi market so the DeFi market is kind of creating a marketplace for insurance cash flows, for uh, invoice refactoring, and and then as as those kind of use cases flow into the public chain environment, DeFi creates a market, and as as it creates a market, it actually grows. So I think you're starting to see really the start of an internet of contracts that goes beyond tokenization, and I I think that 
eventually, whether you're you're running an intranet-based system or whether you're running an internet-based system, right, whether it's a closed system or an open system, we all converge kind of on one global global system that does all of all, all of these things in unison with with various other chains and environments. And so I, I think right now you're really starting to see the beginning of that uh, start to take hold in different different environments, whether it's an internet based environment or an internet based environment. Um, I think it's it's kind of fascinating that DeFi is creating a market, and then there's other types of smart contracts that are selling their cash flows or their insurance premiums or their other things into that market, which is actually driving the growth of both DeFi and creating more and more demand for decentralized insurance, uh, blockchain gaming, uh, all kinds of supply chain and invoice refactoring use cases. But those are really just the tip of tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of in terms of what's getting on production now. So I, I have a follow up on DeFi, I guess, for both Joe and Sergey. Who who's using DeFi? Um, we talk about insurance, right? Like. Is it someone, normal person, insuring their phone in a way that's cheaper than if I went to AXA? Or is it, you know, or even or some other DeFi application? Or is it just, you know, crypto traders using it? Uh, where is use, use now? And, like, when you hear of, like, volumes going up on DeFi platforms, what are we actually talking about? Yeah, so there's... there's uh, go ahead. Oh, oh you're a second. Cool. Thanks. Um, just just to quickly clarify, I think there's two nuances. There, there, there's one nuance where if you make decentralized insurance, companies like Arbol provide that decentralized insurance to farmers that 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 don't need to know or or really interact with the crypto ecosystem. But the fact that they're providing smart contract powered insurance takes the cash flow from the existing world and it brings it in to the crypto world. And then the DeFi market as a kind of global financial system alternative um, creates a market for those for those cash flows and for 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 decentralized insurance output in general. So you you have th this is really the, the shift from tokenization to other types of contracts. So as as contracts start being used not to just generate tokens but to generate contractual relationships, you're going to see more and more consumers relying on them. But then you'll see the output of that economic activity make its way into the DeFi markets because the DeFi markets will be a place to monetize that activity. And the monetization of it will happen uh, by traders and by purchasers in, in the DeFi landscape, which, which, by the way, will just become more and more accessible. The DeFi landscape isn't going to become less accessible. It's going to ras rapidly become more and more accessible. And I think at the end of the day, various applications like Robinhood and even banks are simply going to say, look, if my users want to access the DeFi markets, uh, I'm going to give them access to those markets, just like they're already saying, if my users want cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, I'm going to get a custody solution, give them access to Bitcoin. And so for me, it's, it's pretty much an inevitable outcome that the DeFi protocols being made now are the DeFi protocols that will in a year be viewed like Bitcoin is viewed today by institutions as like, you know, I, I want to be in a position to give my users access to cryptocurrencies. Well, in one year, everybody's going to want to be in a position to give people to give their users access to DeFi protocols. And one year is yeah, a very so, short time frame. Joe, do you agree on the time frame? And maybe can you um, give us an yeah. example of who's using so, the? Yeah, there there are um, um, legacy economy or traditional economy insurance companies, whether they're bigger insurance companies or or smaller, more agile ones that are uh, making use of smart contracts to offer insurance on bicycle rentals or phones, um, parameterized insurance for different situations like uh, flight cancellation. Um, uh, a good amount of, uh, of the excitement around insurance protocols is indeed squarely in DeFi, where um, certain smart contracts, certain uh, financial protocols um, uh, are being covered um, uh, by uh, protocols like Nexus Mutual. Uh, so uh, these are situations where uh, people who people are wiring up um, some different uh, uh, DeFi internet money Legos into 
systems that produce yield, um, but uh, the, it, it's still early days and uh, these systems are, are rough around the edges uh, and uh, people have been cut. Um, and so um, there is significant interest in, in uh, protecting uh, oneself if one is entering into a trade or, or staking uh, some money uh, in a DeFi protocol. Um, you can uh, potentially uh, cover any potential loss or, or partial loss. Um, and uh, these protocols essentially um, enable capital formation uh, from the crowd, uh, and then the crowd is able to uh, uh, collect premium. Uh, and in some cases, it's uh, less of a strict insurance contract and more of a, uh, a mutual uh, protection. Um, and uh, in those kinds of situations, uh, you have people assessing uh, claims of loss. And, uh, and so far, uh, we've seen uh, very reasonable uh, voting on payouts for, uh, for the situations that uh, warranted. Hey, Anna can, I, Anna, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. So I, I'm 30 plus years in the financial markets. I've owned broker dealers and, and the like. These are highly regulated markets. And every time I dial into one of these things and hear about all of the, you know, forward leading statements on, on all the things that are going on for, on Ethereum, I learn a lot. You know, the question is kind of what is live and what's the impact. And even if these smart contracts are being used in De DeFi, and I'm not aware of it, no, that wouldn't surprise me. But the regulators in the insurance market and in, uh, in the finance market is going to have something to say about this. So um, are we talking about something that's five years out, seven years out, 10 years out? Where's the regulatory framework for all of this? Are we talking about stuff now or are we talking about things five, seven or 10 years out from now? Because then, you know, I would I would examine things a little bit differently. Sure. So um I was careful to, to point out that uh, some of these systems are not strictly insurance. Um, and uh, if you, so generally um, smart teams are, are uh, working with law firms uh, to define structures that are acceptable in the jurisdictions that they operate. Um, uh, so for certain kinds of approaches, uh, the time is now um, for um, other kinds of approaches. Um, if you're already a, uh, a regulated insurance company, um, it may not take very long to get your regulator uh, comfortable with uh, the software that uh, um, facilitates your systems uh, running on a blockchain rather than a, uh, a centralized server. Okay. So, that's, that's, sorry, go ahead, Anne. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm keen to know like what kind of transaction level and volume we're seeing and, and how the smart contracts and law works, but that's for another day. Thank you. So I, I guess this is for everyone. I remember when I, I started focusing more on, on when I covered blockchain on sort of blockchain and finance, which I guess is more the domain that David did, but also Joe to an extent. And I remember at the beginning, I heard that blockchain was going to get rid of custodian, um, all sorts of intermediaries that are there for a reason, but at the very beginning, like even, you know, um, analysts at like market structure firms were saying that this was going to happen. And, and as of now, it's not really happened yet. So will it dis actually disintermediate someone or in the end, once it gets implemented, you realize that you do need people in the middle? I'm not just, I'm not talking banks, banks necessarily. I'm just talking steps. And if so, like, is it five years, 10 years, 20 years, like how long and how do you keep people and sort of engage that long that they don't get, you know, they stop believing that anything is going to happen? The wrong question. Well, there, there are uh, wallets in our ecosystem that enable um, people to self-custody their own assets. Uh, uh, the Gnosis Safe wallet system um, holds billions of dollars worth of assets. Um, and um, there are software developers uh, that built that, but uh, it's out on the blockchain and, uh, uh, and anybody can use it. Anybody can create their own instance. I think there are 150,000 instances. Um, um, 
our own wallet, uh, MetaMask, uh, we have uh, somewhere around 1.5 million uh, users. Um, and it is also a non-custodial wallet. We, we don't uh, control the assets in the wallet. The user um, is in full control uh, of those assets. And uh, the user, whether it's uh, the Gnosis Safe Wallet or the MetaMask Wallet, uh, can choose to participate in decentralized finance activities, uh, earn some yield, um, lend money, borrow money, um, and, and many other kinds of activities. Uh, and what they're interacting with, the intermediary, um, for the most part, is a protocol. It's software that, uh, uh, that they're sending their assets to. Um, the assets are resident in that protocol and custodied by that protocol, uh, according to uh, well security audited, uh, in most cases, hopefully, um, and well understood uh, rules and procedures. Um, and so, yeah, there are, there are new kinds of intermediaries um, and new kinds of custodians, uh, but for for the most part, uh, it is uh, um, significantly under the control of the user. Um, there are some situations uh, where the law requires um, a custodian uh, for certain kinds of interactions. And so we've actually had to build uh, an explicit uh, custodian node, uh, uh, even though it wasn't really strictly necessary for the application just to uh, conform to a law. <clears throat> David, do you want to add anything or have no, an And I've, I've been, you know, if I think back five years ago was to your point, custodians will be gone. Everybody's going to be buying stuff at Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just a realist. We're delivering solutions that save, you know, millions and tens of millions of dollars to our, to our customers now. And after that, it was the custodians were going to be gone. And now, you know, the D, D, uh, DeFi, which I think is very interesting. And like I said, I think these thought experiments are are interesting. You know, at R3, we're taking a very, very different approach to this uh, market. And, you know, we're focusing on um, delivering solutions now uh, that leverage off of some of these technologies. But I do feel that as a blockchain community, we're always talking about the next great thing. We talk about billions and billions of assets. Well, there are billions and billions of dollars of cryptocurrencies and the like that don't easily translate into the real economy. Um, so, you know, we are seeing some progress on the edges and there's a, there's a very uh, significant correlation to the value between the value of, current, of the cryptocurrencies and, and the interest in some of these products and, uh, and the like. But, it, it just sometimes comes across to me as just a little bit dreamy. It's always the next thing. And, you know, we're trying to stay laser focused on uh, enterprise blockchain. Well, Dave, you and I were both around when the Internet didn't exist and it has uh, um, developed rapidly and transformed everything. Um, we're seeing the same kind of innovation going on in the decentralized protocol space. So a question, I guess, maybe, Sergey, you can start off since, since you you haven't spoken in a bit, but just for everyone, uh, uh, when when is it actually when it's when are the benefits of blockchain going to impact the man on the street? And it can be across anything. You know, you uh, um, I don't know if we mentioned it on this panel or another, but you know, I remember maybe a couple of years ago, even a big supermarket chain said that blockchain they, you could use blockchain to track products. I I haven't seen anyone a supermarket or my friends or my family one knows that you can do that or has done that. So has it trickled down to normal people? And I'm not talking about crypto traders, like actual the granny on the street. Is she seeing any benefits of blockchain? And if not, when? Um, and do you believe that, that it will happen? Yeah, sure. So, so to answer partly the previous question and, and kind of this one maybe at the same time, I, I think the way that this, this happens is that you always need a system in place to facilitate certain types of interactions between people on a contractual basis. And that's all the examples we talked about, they're just contractual interactions. And if you look at how the world has developed, you know, maybe before you would have gone, you know, to a store to buy soap or to buy books, 
right? But then Amazon came and you were able to order that soap or that book from Amazon. But then the next evolution of that is actually that there are other sellers on Amazon. So Amazon created a marketplace where people could go. I was I was in an Uber ride before the pandemic happened and I just was talking to the Uber driver because he seemed like a nice, interesting person. And so he, ride, he drives an Uber and he sells... Uh, home goods on Amazon as an Amazon seller, right? And I think it was probably pretty tough to imagine. And and before this, he was a teacher or something. He had some other profession, and it was it was hard to it's it's hard to imagine. However, many years ago, that some guy is going to be ride sharing his car and that he's going to be selling, you know, home goods like soap over the Amazon marketplace and being able to do that efficiently. Um, and that's going to that's gonna be the soap that I buy or that's going to be the ride that I take to the airport in, in Denver or wherever. And that's hard to imagine, but that's that's where we are, right? And so I, 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 I mean, it's hard to imagine back then. Now it's obvious to imagine. Obviously, you would use an uh, Uber. Obviously, you would have a marketplace where people competitively compete to provide the highest uh, quality goods at the lowest price with the fastest shipping speed. I mean, that's just obvious at this point, right? And I, I think it's going to be the exact exact same thing. To to answer the second question that that you posed just now, how how fast it'll happen? It'll happen at different speeds in different industries depending on need. So there are there are certain vertical use cases, you know, such as books. Books are a good vertical use case. Turns out for e-commerce, you know, they don't have a shelf life. A lot of people want to buy books, apparently. Those people, you know, are early internet adopters. And so that's a good initial use case. Of the initial use cases that I see, um, a lot of them are in the financial world. And that's proven by the fact that PayPal lets people buy cryptocurrency. I think, you know, PayPal doesn't just give up that real estate in their really, really limited mobile application just because they feel like it. I think they spend a lot of time researching that. And I think if I had to guess what the research shows is that inflation is coming and everybody is going to realize that the assets and the wealth that they have is not as safe as they thought it was. And their alternative to that is going to be uh, crypto assets, Bitcoin, and DeFi products that give them access to that. So... I, I think it's going to be vertically focused, specific use cases um, where people start to see the benefits of this. I think one of those is already uh, a hedge against inflation. I think others are insurance for farmers that might not even know they're having blockchain-based insurance, but they are. And I, I, I don't think it's just going to be one massive overnight thing. Um, I think it's going to be in a, in a few vertically focused cases where it's particularly relevant, and then it's going to grow from there. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah, of PayPal. I wonder if it's just them trying to monetize uh, Venmo, given that there's money in crypto trading. And I don't know if it's perhaps confusing for viewers to look at crypto and then together blockchain, or maybe the two should be looked together and they're separated too often. But unfortunately, we could speak about this for hours, but I'm being told by the uh, chat nearby that we're, um, that we're done. We don't have any more time. So I want to thank you all for your time. Um, Hope to talk to you soon. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you. Care. Great chatting with you. Have a good one, guys. Thank you.